Good morning, everybody. Eddie Webb. We're here at the New Media Lab at Mesa Community College. This morning, we are very, very privileged to have with our own Maricopa Chief of Police, David Denlinger, with us. And we're gonna we want to talk a little bit about safety and policing across Maricopa, across the campuses. We had some uh, folks on on a couple, three, four, five shows ago, and we were talking about the college here. It published a paper on white supremacy, and they're holding all sorts of uh, workshops and conversations around social justice and race issue uh, relations and, and all that sort of stuff. And uh, the killing of George Floyd came up in one of those conversations, and as did uh, the activity, uh, the part of the police a police officer. And so uh, we thought, you know, we're academics, we're a, a learning institute, we're people that explore these uh, sociology and, and all of that stuff. And so we really needed to hear from you. And we're so happy that you accepted our invitation to be with us today. Thank you for having me here. So what's, uh, what's your background in law enforcement? So I've got 40 years in law enforcement at this time. I've been with the community college district for eight and a half years. I came on as the deputy chief in 2012, and I'll talk a little about our department background. Yeah. But I came over as the deputy chief after retiring from the Arizona Department of Public Safety. Okay. And then I've been the chief of police for the college district for almost two years at this time. Wow, congratulations. Thank you. And prior to that, the experience I had, I spent 32 years with the Arizona Department of Public Safety, which is our state's state police agency. Mm -hmm. I spent my first nine years as a patrol officer and sergeant in northern Arizona, including the Navajo and Hopi Indian nations. All right. And then I moved to Phoenix, where I was a criminal investigation sergeant. And then I promoted to lieutenant, moved to Tucson, where I was both a patrol and an investigation commander. And finally, in 2004, I returned to Phoenix, where I promoted and had command jobs, including human resources, internal affairs, the training academy and training program, the law and legal section, public records. And finally, I, uh, the two jobs I also had, I was the chief of the state's criminal investigation division, and I was also the director of the state counterterrorism center. Wow. Well, we are very, very fortunate to have you. No, it's been a great place to come, and our community, it's exceeded my expectations. Yeah. It is an amazing organization. I think, uh, I, I, I don't think we even begin to reach our potential, you know, of what this organization can do. I think the I think there are great days ahead of us if we get the right folks in the right places. Anyway, yeah, again, that's a that's an impressive, very impressive uh, resume and commitment to law enforcement in your entire life. It sounds like you look like a young guy. I did, I would, <laughs> wouldn't have guessed forty years in the. What I what I noticed because uh, I used to go to all the district governing board meetings. And I noticed you were always there, right? Your guys Correct. were always there. Yes. You were always greeting people and being friendly with people and making people feel welcome. At the same time, you're making sure everybody's safe. Yes. That's an art. You know, when I was a young guy, uh, you know, I around a lot of bouncers and stuff at, at, at bars. And, and that's a, a profession. I remember a guy always saying that, you know, what you want to do, you see the guy that you think that's going to be a problem, the first thing you want to do is go over and shake his hand, make him your friend, right? Pull him in and, and diffuse things before anything happens. And so, you know, that profession of, uh, of providing safety for the community members, I think, I think we all need to be a little more appreciative towards the work that you do. No, thank yeah. you. And it's good. It's, it's so good to see professionals in these jobs, you know, and, and doing it the right way. So we kind of want to get into this area. And, uh, again, I, I know I'm infusing a little bit of my own experience here, but what, what, what I grew up, I grew up in, a, in, a, in Los Angeles and played Pop Warner football, baseball, you know, every sport there was, basketball. And in the sick, this was in the 60s. And growing up, there was always police officers there, but they weren't there to be, you know, they were there to integrate into the community, you know, helping out and right. 
And there was this really amazing relationship between law enforcement and the schools. You know, they would be at, come into the schools, talk. Uh, but there, were, there was always a presence of one or two police officers, you know, during the games. And when you're a kid, you don't know that they're actually policing, but, but they were doing more than that. They were, right. you know, I mean, like out on the field and, and it, you know, integrating themselves. Somewhere along the line, that stopped happening. And it sort of, I even notice on the police cars now, it used to say to protect and serve, and it yeah. doesn't say that anymore. What, what are the some most radical or significant changes that you've seen in that relationship between law enforcement and the public? Or have you? Have we gotten better? Or? So I think you see a pendulum is what actually has taken place. And so back in the day, even in the days you're talking about, cities even had requirements that their officers had to live in the city so that they were part of the community. And then as law enforcement grew and a lot of other law enforcement methods, it got to be where you had people that don't live in the community. They're not part of the community. They're there to do their job. And they really didn't mix with the community other than we typically would see people at their worst moments, but not at their best moments. And so the pendulum had gone too far where we didn't have a relationship. And when you have tragedies that occur, it's important to have a relationship before you need a relationship. Right. And so what you really saw, at least in my experience in the 1990s, was the pendulum started returning to, hey, we need community policing. We need problem-oriented policing where we get with the leadership in the community to find out what their problems are and solve problems. And so the pendulum has really been returning with realizing how important it is. But with some of the waves over the years we've seen now with, and we're going to talk about George Floyd, but there's not a bigger time that we need to have community relationships than to be able to have open dialogue right now. And I've been real sorry this year that COVID has really prevented a lot of our face-to-face opportunity just when we need each other the most. Yeah. So the pendulum has really been returning where we need to be part of the community, we need to represent the community, we need to listen to the community, engage with the community. And honestly, that, that's been part of why I came here to the community college district to actually have a community that we could be part of. And, and we do have a motto in our department. When we created our district-wide police department in 2012, our models make a difference, and that's what we hope we do in somebody's life, either employees or students. Is by the time you've interacted with us, we hope we made a difference. Yeah, that's that's great. It's good news. I I hope in the folks that are listening that are in positions to welcome law enforcement into our community and welcome them into the activities that we do, we'll uh, we'll take you up on that. And uh, be a part. Do you have a, any designated officers that do community work, or is this just a, a, everybody's on board? Any opportunity? So our department, district wide, has a little over seventy sworn police officers, and it's our expectation that everybody's a community relations officer. But some of our momentum on what I was trying to accomplish, uh, COVID, kind of held that up. But what we were hoping to create on every campus, and we're still going to get back to this at this point, is create a public safety committee made up of people from the different constituent groups, you know, faculty, employees, students. And those are the people that we can have regular meetings, talk about what's going on on campus, if there's rumors or concerns. You know, we need to have an open group that we create that dialogue. We've got a success story a few years ago at one of our colleges that had a mini crime wave, and we formed just such a group. And with working together to try to identify opportunities for improvement, for safety improvements, education, uh, crime was reduced on that campus by almost 80%. Wow. And that was through that group working together, and they actually won a couple of national awards for their work together. So we want to engage the college community with that, but also we want to engage our student population. I would schedule in March to meet with the student senate district-wide to talk about partnering on public safety issues and public education. And I was fortunate to be invited back last week. 
and met with our student senate and we talked again about partnering on public safety issues which is going to be done by our campus police with our campus students when they figure out the structure we want to interact but i also brought up that this is our point in time to have dialogue about the social justice criminal justice reform whatever these people see that's going on and uh part of what we offer when i say make a difference is our motto we're not the police in somebody's community where they live. People show up here to take their class to work, they leave, and they don't see us other than that. So the people you see on TV that you might be concerned about, that's not us. And so we're open to dialogue and to be able to talk about things going on, open to talk about what really takes place in our department. You know, we've got a very good department and high standards in the people that we hire. And so we're proud to be able to show that and have open dialogue with people. And that's what we're hoping now, post-COVID and, and with the George Floyd incident being just the beginning of the wave, is let's not let this go away. Let's keep the momentum going and continue to have discussions and build relationships. This is wonderful news. There's three sorts of parts uh, that I'd like to get into, which you yeah. just talked about. One was um, sworn to what? When you're sworn in, what are you sw sworn to? The other thing is this notion of officers that only see crime in a community that they don't live in. And that has to psychologically change their behavior because uh, they're not getting to celebrate, you know, and I think that's what's missing. We, in a lot of ways, you know, I mean, Unfortunately, I think politics have become about politics. And I think everybody in their gut, no matter where they are on the spectrum of that, feel that inside, that we're going down a road that we have to stop. This idea of us against them and division, right? We have to come together as a community. And I mean, the cornerstone of that for me is, is law enforcement because, you know, this is where. This is what our country is built on, a country of laws, supposedly, right? But when you and I are able to sit and watch a man be choked to death for nine minutes with his hands behind his back and officers with their knees pinning down. Now, I was in martial arts for 25 years. That was a blood choke. There's no, you can't get around it. That man was murdered. I watch it for myself. I can see every time he squirms, the grip gets tighter and tighter and tighter. This has created riots, right? Mm -hmm. More violence on top of violence. It's like, and we can't do that. You know, you can't stop the violence with violence. I, I don't think we do have the biggest military in the world, so maybe yeah. I'm completely wrong about that. But um, the notion, I think the only people that can fix that our law enforcement. The other people around there have to hold that officer accountable. Not me as a citizen, not a bystander. We can't do that. And as long as this brotherhood exists, where officers protect other officers from committing murder, we're going to have a problem, right? So that's right at the center of all of this, what we need to fix. And your approach of going out into the bigger spectrum of that and rebuilding these, these trust and these relationships, I think is so significant to our future. Uh, but again, I, I, until I, I just think until other officers hold other officers account, just like teachers. You know, if I did, uh, could you imagine a teacher doing something, even a grip on the arm, we'd be out of here before the sun went down. Right? So. That sort of justice, uh, we have to be a country of laws, and the people that enforce the law have to follow the law. It's just that simple, right? Right. Um, so during all of this sort of pushback on George Floyd's death and the lack of urgency around law enforcement to handle this, I, I guess the gentleman is out now on bail. What was your perception as a law enforcement officer? Watch, did you watch the clip? I have seen the clip. What was your response to that? Um, I can tell you that most law enforcement officers, when they see clips, and that's not the only clip you find on sure. YouTube, 
they're the first ones to say, holy cow, here it comes again. You know, we don't like to see things like that any more than any other viewer. It was obviously something that was very troubling. Troubling? Yes. It was a murder. Yes. And, uh, you know, you've got two things. You've got the community wants immediate justice, yet the wheels of justice turn at a certain speed. Right. And that's part of the frustration that I often see with the community is, you know, they want answers now or, sure. you know, we wait for the end result. And the end result, we don't know what it'll be, and it may not be what people want either once yeah. it comes down to the end. Yeah. So where I really saw that was just a turning point that we really need to have dialogue yeah. and, and develop relationships where people can bring concerns. Another real wave you've seen in law enforcement right now that's a priority, and we've adopted it as well in our training and policy, is that officers have a duty to intervene if they see somebody committing an excessive use of force and a duty to report it as well. Yeah, and I guess, you know, uh, my mindset is to be uh, supportive of law enforcement. Yes. And so I, I mean, I could feel myself right there. I get in a little, little because yes, it, because because I come from those neighborhoods, right? And and I know what I saw. But you're correct. We have a process. You know, we have a charge. We have a a trial. We have a judge. We have a jury, and we have a conviction. Yeah, that's due process. But it's hard to let that happen when you and I and everyone in the world can see the evidence for ourselves. See, this is the, this is, I think, the difference. Yeah. Right? Before, you know, the reports could get written in a different way. I mean, we see people get freed from prison all the time now, you know, because of technology. So when you watch something like that, you're right. It's, it is deeply troubling. Yeah. It was, it was, I mean, I watched it once because I, I just, I felt like I needed to for this conversation that we're we're yeah. having, but man, it it's so heartbreaking to watch a man you know be choked to death right on film and and people you know it, it's it, yeah troubling, and, but we do have due process and you're right we need to make sure that uh, as citizens we do our part with due process as well, as long as there is justice right because in our neighborhood they used to say just us right yeah and so yeah we need because these uh incidences you know when people make light of it like well you know or compare well you know there were 10 people you know had these troubling experiences with law enforcement you know 10 12 but there were you know thousands of people die for drunk dr you know and we make right. these false equivalencies that's troubling as as well but anyway, yeah, we, we really want to say to the Floyd family, too, uh, you know, we understand the, the best that we can the, the, uh, your loss of your son and your brother, father. So where you're, you're doing this uh, work with the, the Senate, the, uh, the students, who, yes. who initiated that? Did you do that? I did earlier in the year wanting to reach out. Uh, we had a good example at Chandler Gilbert where their student council uh, partnered with public safety on a crime prevention detail. And I wanted to develop that relationship where the students take ownership for their safety. Yeah. And the students decide what they feel their safety issues are on each campus. And that way we were responsive to that and able to develop a relationship to that. Yeah. But again, this year with things that have gone on, it's gone deeper than that. And so what I proposed is, uh, and again, it's in their court right now, yeah. but to create what type of dialogue they want to have. And I suggested there may be certain campuses that have certain concerns that we need to, to afford that dialogue. There may be some generic topics across the whole district, like uses of force that they want to do forums on. And there may be certain focus groups. Maybe there's DACA students that want to have some interaction with our police. And again, we're not the police in people's communities, so yeah. we want to be that non-threatening group that can have dialogue that maybe gives you experience on how to air your concerns down the road somewhere else as well. So we're really hoping to develop this relationship with our student government and our student body. Yeah, and that's exciting that 
you've taken leadership in that area. Uh, earlier, I'd ask you when you got you said sworn officers. What yes. Is it that they, what is it they're sworn to? So there's a couple of answers to that. Uh, when you get sworn in, you raise your right hand like people do in the military and, and swear that you'll defend the Constitution, uphold the law. But uh, what it really is is a legal term that it's, again, a person in our community that's been given the authority to essentially make arrests. You know, and that's huge. It's uh, yeah. uh, people don't think of it that way, but it's the authority to take away somebody's freedom when you decide, you know, I'm taking them into custody. So it takes a real responsible person to make those decisions appropriately. There's different states that have different background standards. Arizona is very solid in terms of the backgrounds we have for you to be able to be trained and become a sworn police officer. And here in the Maricopa College District, we've got very high standards. And people have probably noticed that most of our officers are older as you go around campuses. A lot of retired. A lot of retired people. And there's some benefits to that where we made a, a decision to look for experience. One of them is we don't have student housing. So if you were a brand new officer out of the academy, you don't have the volume of activity you could go to to really become proficient. Uh -huh. So hiring experienced people, they already know how to perform our duties when the time comes. Yeah. But the real big benefit on that is I was the former human resource commander where I came from. And when you go to hire a candidate that you don't want to be on YouTube down the road, you're looking at everything you can in their background to try to make the best possible judgment call uh -huh. that this person has what it takes to make responsible decisions and has the ethics and the morals. Well, by hiring experienced police officers, we get to go look at their file, where they came from, and find out what their history really was. And we do reject people that have complaint histories or use of force histories because we don't need that here. Right, right. So we're really proud of the standards that we do have that serves our college community and gives us the confidence that we know what we have here. Is there a place that uh, on the website where the people can go and see, like, I, I'm a, I'm the, when you swear, like, I have to sign a contract with the, with the college as a faculty member that I'm, right. you know, there's a behavioral thing in and out of the class that we sign or used to sign. Is there a place where uh, somebody could go and look and, I mean, do, is it a tradition, like, they hold their hand up, they swear, or is that a pledge, or is it just part of the contract when they sign their contract? So really where your deep dive would be on that yeah. is the Arizona Peace Officer Standards and Training Board, AZ okay. Post. And they're the ones that certify police officers in the state. And they've got a set of regulations. You can find the link on their website. And that goes through everything, in, including the original hiring standards, what types of morals and ethics the person has to have, mm. what the disqualifiers are. It goes through what the training requirements are. It goes through what the reasons would be to take away a police officer's certification. And I believe that original, you know, what I raise my right hand to be sworn in is in those regulations as well. So is there a, you know, I had, when I talked to people, there were a few questions that came up for you from, from our community. So there's a Mesa police force, law enforcement, and then we have Maricopa and your badge says police. So is it the same or is it, is it an internal subcontracting? Is it a, our own Maricopa, like a private, law enforcement agency or is this still tied to the county or the state or the city or how, how does this work so the departments are belong to their political subdivision we all have to meet the same standards the same training standards by az post and so the mesa officers they happen to work for the city of mesa within the city of mesa and the community college district is actually a political subdivision of its own. Uh -huh. And by statute, each community college district in the state can choose to have a sworn police department. Wow. All right. That's cool. So you have more uh, sovereignty and oversight than 
you can create the kind of law enforcement presence that you see, right? That you want to see. You don't have to adhere to, I mean, not outside of, you know, I mean, if Mesa City police are, are not engaged in the community the way you are, you, you, you're free to do that. Is what That's I'm correct. Yeah. Yes, we're, we're uh, completely separate from any of the other police departments responsible for our campuses. Yeah. And, uh, you know, our philosophy is we do want to be part of the community. We want to be transparent. There's some additional things we're doing this year in transparency in our yeah. department. And ultimately, you know, we're empowered by the governing board. Right. And they chose, prior to 2012, each of the 10 colleges had their own campus safety department, which were independent with a little bit of oversight. And the governing board voted to create a district-wide professional police department in 2012. And so this is why you have a chief yes. yourself, and then you have commanders out in each campus. Correct. Prior to 2012, each campus had what they called a public safety director, Director, okay. and they were independent. We also didn't have common report writing systems, so we had no way to determine if a criminal was hitting multiple colleges. And so by creating a professional department, we've been able to link connected crimes between colleges, wow. actually solve crimes, recover property really uh, create a standard in hiring standards and what our background standards are. And so we've just seen a lot of return on the investment for the quality. And one of the big ones, you know, from prior to that model was local police were still called in if you had your purse stolen, your car stolen. And they're understaffed, so they weren't going to assign a detective to go look for your iPhone or your purse. Right. But that's the value we add because we do have time to do that. Yeah. And so that's what we've really be, been able to create and the value we've returned to the district. Awesome. Yeah, it's, it's so difficult for me to think about crime <laughs> on a college campus, right? I mean, I know for me, I would think there would be, you know, opportunity, petty theft, you know. But the idea that there are actually people who target specific colleges because they understand people are going to park their car a long way away from where they're at. There's, uh, I don't know, you know, I don't want to give any uh, methods away about surveillance and stuff, but I've noticed some more and more cameras have popped up. I always wave to mine in the morning yeah. when I get out of my car, hoping somebody sees. Uh, but that idea, you know, of people actually casing uh, a college because of what level of crime and and I don't I th I know we've had so, I, I, I've been here 21 years I've had I think Ford one, came up in one of those conversations and as this scary the, the activity where it, the really, part of the it really was it didn't happen ape. here they were chasing some guy and he came he was running through here and they, you know but what what is the most common type of crime you would see at a college so the most common crime is your simple thefts, yeah. and that's typically people that aren't watching their property. Uh, we've had some auto thefts. We've had assaults. We've had a few aggravated assaults. There's been a s small number of sexual assaults, uh, mm -hmm. uh, flashers, you know, for lack of a better term, really? indecent exposure cases. Wow. Uh, theft is the big one, yeah. and it really varies by college by what types of crime they get. Mm -hmm. Uh, Mesa and Glendale are the biggest two campuses, so as you would expect, they they may get more, but some of the other colleges, by virtue of location, they may have other types of opportunistic crime available. Maybe they're next to the light rail. Uh, so theft's the most common, but part of the value we brought also was to start now looking at statistics to try to determine what the trends are by campus. Nice. And that's part of our current effort right now this year is to do trend analysis. And then part of our intent is those public safety committees, that'll be part of our outreach and education. Yeah. And uh, these are things you can do to prevent, things we can work with that college administration to improve. And that's some of that value we add now by having record systems and taking a look scientifically at what our trends are so we can do something about it. Yeah. 
That's that's great to see all of that integration and big data and you know trying to get out in front of these kinds of things. Because my my assumption again would be you know an an opportunist criminal who maybe you know maybe had those tendencies or maybe I don't know maybe there's a drug problem going on maybe there's somebody's hungry I I don't know what may I mean I guess I we we all what makes a person still something, right? And what, what are yeah. they going to do with it, right? But that idea that people actually case the parking lot and pop in the cars or find an unlocked car, I think with what you're doing of raising consciousness through these different committees and, uh, and having this conversation is people can be responsible. Make sure to, you know, not just to lock your car, but don't leave your laptop on the driver's seat or passenger, right? Don't, don't create, help law enforcement by not creating these scenarios. Hello, everybody. We are here at the New Media Lab at Mesa Community College talking with our very own Maricopa Chief of Police, David Denlinger. And uh, we're talking about building these relationships between uh, Maricopa law enforcement and the 200,000 plus people that come to come to the 10 different colleges and how we can build a positive relationship and support each other. We'll be right back. 